No, no, you got it. No, I, 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 you need to follow the principle of being as lazy as possible. I need to write a script for that. Just, it's never struck me before. It's definitely one of the, if there is, uh, for those who are computer science majors or even SINs majors, you'd be best served by becoming intimate enough with Linux that you can write shell scripts. That will save your, li your uh, time and your lifetime immensely. The class script too. Shell script. Yeah, I taught it the first semester I was here, and I wouldn't mind teaching it again. Um, uh, I don't know how good the teaching is now, but the way I approached it is having been using Unix and Linux since 1990, 91. Um, I've got like a thousand things that I've done to write scripts for, and so I, it, just, it just makes a great projects class, right? And you have to take this data and do this, that, and the other thing, and blah, 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 and, and it just, it, you learn a lot, uh, real hands-on. So I like teaching that class. What class is this? Shell programming. I haven't taught it, though, since uh, I was here in spring of 2012. So I was just saying I don't have any idea of what's being done in it now, but it's a... Uh, just by virtue of me having course releases, I haven't taught taught it again, but it's a class I'd like to teach again. So who knows? Maybe in the next year or two. Uh, anyway, uh, I know that there are a number of posts on Piazza that I haven't replied to. I apologize for that. I will get to those today. Yesterday I was finishing my daughter's fifth grade model of an atom project with her. And... Uh, had a problem with both the uh, protons and the neutrons being too close in color, so we had to do an 11th hour repainting of the, the neutrons, and as a result, I wasn't able to assemble the nucleus till like 2 in the morning when it had all dried. And then I get a text from my wife this morning that as the teacher was hanging up the atom, she dropped it, and there were protons, electrons, and neutrons, not to mention the shell of the atom, scattered around the room of the class. So. A regular uh, nuclear accelerator there at Hooker Oak, busting up atoms. There was no explosion. There was no explosion, fortunately. Just uh, a few little glue dots and the atom was reassembled. All right. But enough about fifth, fifth grade physics. Let's talk about your problems. Uh, what do you got going for me? You got some questions? None? Any? Yes? Okay, so the, que the question is regarding assignment 11 and a little bit of discomfort as to the exact problem you're solving, process you go through, something of that nature. So I, I can uh, talk about the assignment in a little bit more depth. Here's the, as a, an instructor, the reason for the assignment and my former TA who graduated last semester had created this one for me. The, the intent is for you to, one, start nosing around more thoroughly in the reference documentation for C++, uh, in particular the standard libraries, and uh, just expose you to a couple of them. Uh, as, you, as I've said before, as you continue in your career, you're going to be spending the majority of your time looking things up. You'll see that even after I've been doing C++ for so many years, I end up half the time going to a reference to look it up because I can't remember the order of the arguments or the name of the function or something like that. And the same should be true for you, that uh, it's not an exercise in memorization, but an exercise in knowing how to use the resources. So that's why we have this assignment. So the, the three stages is to get you to write three programs and to use three different things that are in the standard library that you may not have used before. And the, the way that those programs should be structured, let's say assignment 11 structure, 
is um, you write a function string. I'm just going to be generic here. And in main, you have to read in a file for each line in the file. Now, one thing that there, uh, to the way this is structured, the intent is that you return what is being manipulated because of pass by value semantics. So when I pass in a line from the file, that line from the file is copied into S so that anything that I do with S inside this function is not going to affect this variable right here. All right, this is just the stuff we've talked about before, general pass by value semantics. You're working with a copy of quote line from file. Uh, as a result, um, I need to capture those changes for later writing back out to the file, and the easiest way to do that is just to do this. And so that's why it returns a string, and why I'm returning the input, assuming that I change s in some way. It, the alternative is I could copy s into xyz, manipulate xyz, and then return xyz. Right? The bottom line is whatever you're changing, return that and reassign it to your original variable. So that'll give you the changed version. And then after you're done doing that, it is to write out the file using the new strings. Uh, also, every, every file begins sample input file.txt. Every, every one begins with a number. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, there we go. So, the very first number tells you how many lines you have in the file, and then what should be following are that many lines in the file. And so, if the task were to change the word this to that, then my func here would look for the word this and change it to that. And then what I would need to be writing out to the file would be something that looks exactly like this, except everywhere I have this, I would want that. All right. Also, each of, these, each of these programs not only has you do a translation of the file and then writing the file back out, but it has you adding a line, doesn't it say something like decrypt stage one complete or something like that, right? So the idea when you write out these files, the first thing you write out are the number of lines you're about to write out. So somewhere you're going to be doing a my out file, I'm going to write out the variable holding number of lines. I will write out, and that is a legal variable name. So that'll be the first thing you do. Maybe I should do that. There'd be that. So then uh, loop. So you loop on reading in. You loop on writing out. The other thing that uh, Teddy is the name of the TA. The other thing that Teddy wants you to do is to exercise your use of new and delete a little bit. So rather than reading in a line, translating it, writing it out. You should read in the entire file, manipulate it, and then write out the entire file. So you need to store all that in an array. After you read in, so here I would have read in the number representing 
the number of lines in the file. You're going to have some sort of, since you're reading in strings, you create a string pointer and that's going to be something like that. So I'll be looping, I'll be looping reading in the file. It's a for loop. Why is it a for loop and not a while loop? Because you know exactly how many lines are going to be in the file. It's in this variable right here that you just read in, in the comment. Read in num lines, allocate that many uh, elements in the array, create a for loop, get line, get line, get line, get line. Uh, you read it into each element of this, then you would create a for loop and you call this function that many times, once for each of these. And then you create another, and then you write. Then you have to write out a file, so you write out the number of lines you're going to write out, then you have a for loop and you write, 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 and then you have to throw in one or two lines after that, uh, saying stage one complete or something to that effect. And then you are, need to clean up. So now you close the file and release the memory you allocated with new. And so you have to write three programs that follow this general template. Now, my question back to you, does that pretty much set you at ease or does this uh, bring further questions to mind? Okay. How about other questions? Yes. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I saw that as one of the posts I wasn't able to address in Piazza. Uh, I think I only glanced at it real quickly when I got the notification email, but I think what was there was correct. Um, so remember that the format of a make file is what to make, what it requires, shell command. And one thing that you may have lost sight of is the fact that you can have as many shell commands here as you want. Meaning, what do I mean by shell command? If you're at a command prompt, anything that you might type there could be anything at all. So, uh, the, did, was, uh, was there requested that the rule have a particular name? run underscore all. So it'd be run underscore all. Uh, what do you need in order to run un, run all? Did it ask for the executables to be named something in particular? Okay, so you have executable one, you have executable two, you have executable three, and what? how do you run executable one? All right, I don't know what you're calling these things. But, but lines 11 through 13 there are things that you would type at the command line to run a program, yes? So that since it, since it asks you to run three programs, that's how you run three programs. You have, say that again. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. You, ab you absolutely have to give unique names to the executables. If they're all A.out, out, then you're going to have exactly one executable. Yes. Uh, I believe in that. I recall seeing in that particular Piazza question, um, it was something about the dot O's, and I believe it was... I think it was something like that. And the question was, what about the dot O? And uh, this just gets 
back to what we were doing from day one, which is you're allowed to create an. You could you could if you wanted put all of your assuming yet you like um, like project two the Joust. I could do something like this. I could just have all of my CPP files and it would combine them together. The dotos do get made, but G++ is doing it all under the hood. It's running all the steps together. It's creating all the dotos and then it's linking them all together. Then it deletes the dotos once it's done creating the executable. So you do not have to go the extra step here to create a an object file. And the reason so now it raises the question, well, Todd, you've been such an ass making us create all these .o files before creating the executable. Why are you giving us the, the pass now? And the reason is that these programs are not multi-file programs. The whole advantage to breaking things up into separate object files is that it, you're optimizing the compiling process. So if I have a thousand source files and I change one of them, I only need to regenerate one object file and then link them together, right? Well, the whole thing's moot if your entire application is in one file. If it's in one file, then just do what you see on line 11. And don't call me an ass again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm going to have a stern talk with myself after class. Okay. Yes? You said that when we read the, what we read into the file, what we read in from the file is strings, right? But are arrays string pointers? No, your array is an array of strings. This let me let me go back to the code. It's, uh, so we're look we're focusing on line twelve here. Yeah. All right. So let me let me show you what's happening here, and let me create it with a different example. So there's a little bit less mystery in dealing with floats. Um, I need to open sketch. And this is allocating array. All right. So the first thing is that I am creating a variable called FP. It's a pointer. If you went through my tutorial, you know that a pointer is nothing more than a glorified integer. So I set up, I set aside some space here create FP. Now, this is a totally separate expression. In fact, these don't even have to be on the same line. Just, to, in fact, I'll go ahead and drive it home by doing that. There. So on the next line of code, I'm going to do the expression right here. And what that expression is going to do is it's going to allocate, yikes, what did I do there? It's going to allocate an array of floating point numbers. How many of them? However big this is. Let's say that's three. So I'm going to get a new array of three floats and that'll be right here. And then what this what this does, this expression, I, I, I'll highlight the whole thing. When the, once this expression is done finding memory, it is going to give back where the beginning of that is. And what, we're, what are we doing with that number? We are assigning it to FP. So that 108 is getting assigned to FP. So I'm not allocating a bunch of float pointers. I am allocating an array of floats. And I'm taking a pointer to, or the address of, the first one of those and assigning it to the pointer. And so all you have to do is do a global search and replace of where I say float and replace it with string, and you have the exact same thing happening.
and and uh, just to make sure that we're clear, once I've done this, I can access SP as if it were an array. So I can say SP sub the 13th one is equal to 90. Uh, right, I can do something like that. Why does this work? Because that, what the compiler does is it translates it to this. And again, SP is 108. Uh, I'm going to steal my floating point version here. SP is 108. So this means that it's going to add 13 to 108. Uh, it's going to find out what kind of thing SP is. It's a string pointer. So it's going to take the length of a string, multiply it by 13, and add it to 108. So I'll end up here at the 14th string somewhere out here. And then that's what Todd gets assigned to. So it's really slick that even though that we're dealing with pointers and stuff, this is just an array. And this syntax that we're accustomed to using for indexing into arrays works perfectly well with what we have written on line 15. So allocate this thing, then use the darn thing like it's an array. Just don't forget when you are done to do that, to release the memory using delete. Other questions? Okay, let me talk a little bit about Project 4 then, shifting gears. Um, I guess we can go here. So one of the main things we have to do in this new version of the project is we now have to deal with equipment. Depot had a vector of employee pointers. Now it has a vector of equipment pointers as well. Now normally equipment is stored by the employee and not by the depot. The only reason we have a vector of equipment pointers in the depot is that not all of that equipment gets assigned to employees. So any leftover equipment that is left unassigned, we go ahead and have the depot hang on to so we don't lose track of it. Uh, what is the, the depot constructor was the big thing. In project three, we had to open up files and read them in, create employees. Uh, you have the exact same routine. You also need to read an equipment though and assign it to employees. And this is a little bit more complex. So you need to try and assign each and every piece of equipment to the lowest grade employee. Now let me set aside lowest grade employee. Um, if I have an employee, I need to take every piece of equipment that I have and say, can you take this piece of equipment? And if I look at the employee class, there is a, a, uh, a new function called take equipment. And it takes an equipment pointer as an argument. I can go ahead and p4 notes. Uh, let me do that in source code form. So there's going to be a function that belongs to the employee class called take equipment. takes an equipment pointer as an argument. Uh, it returns true, otherwise returns false. We'll get back to what that means, but that does, we do know right now, that means that this thing has to return a Boolean, okay? So this is a signature for employees take equipment function. 
What are the conditions under which an employee can take a piece of equipment? There are two possibilities. The required rank of the equipment is less than or equal to the employee's grade. So uh, add EP to employee's equipment vector tools is what we were calling it. If EP's grade, uh, grade required, is less than or equal to employee's grade. Also, at else, add EP to employee's. If EP's ID is in the employee's set of exceptions. If the employee, if the, the employee, the employee takes the equipment or took, accepted, return true, else return false. Any questions on that? So, you're going to, uh, you got a, a vector of employees. You, and you're reading in the tools, you read in a tool, you create a, an equipment using new, and now you go through those employees. Can you take this? Can you take this? Can you take this? And the first one to say yes, bingo, you're done. Read in the next tool and repeat. Can you take this? Can you take this? Can you take this? Okay. And what you should find is that most of the equipment, one employee or another is going to take it, but you'll have a couple pieces of equipment left over, some of the high-grade stuff. Uh, I don't think anyone at the company's passed the test to be able to manipulate the micro wrench. So that is one of the pieces that will be left in the unassigned vector, for instance. Um, so that's what you have to do with that function. Now, the, the, last, the last thing that makes this, this a little bit sticky is that uh, you have to have the employees sorted in order of grade. Now, it just so happened that um, with the employee data file that I gave out for part one, I had all the employees sorted in grade order. I think it's grades two, five, and seven, if I recall, for those three employees. Uh, in the version that I'm providing for this project, I've scrambled them in a different order. Uh, you'll definitely want to grab the new one, or you go in there and use Vim and just delete and paste and get them out of order, right? You want to get them out of order so that you can test that you're sorting them properly. You want to read in all the employees, just like you've been doing, and after you've read in all the employees and you've closed the employee.txt file, then you want to sort that vector so that the lowest grade employee is first and the highest grade employee is last. And so the question is how to sort. So now I'm talking about in Depot's constructor. Does it what? Uh, a set. So semantically, a set doesn't have an ordering, but the employees are in a vector, not a set. So you read in employees. 
Now we need to sort. All right, so now we go ahead and do a little look up here. We type C++ sort. Bingo. And we jet down to the example first. And here they're in their example, let me blow this up. In their sample code here, they have created a vector. That's convenient because we have a vector we need to sort. And they're going to, they've got the, we can ignore this plus four stuff. Uh, they're basically sorting the begin and the end. So that would be something, what is the vector of employees called? Workers dot begin, workers dot end, and we call the sort function. This isn't quite enough to succeed though. What this works great for is it works great for numbers, all right? Works great for single characters. Uh, it'll even work for strings. But the question is, why is it working? How does sort work? So without getting into the details, one of the things you'll learn if you go on to 211 and 311 is there are a number of different algorithms for actually doing sorting. We don't, I don't care about the algorithms generally, but if I gave you 20 pieces of paper with numbers written on them, how would you sort it? And you're going to grab the first two off the stack, and what are you going to do with those first two numbers? You're going to compare them, and you're going to see if one is higher or lower than the other, right? So what's happening, if you were to look at the, the source code to, to sort, uh, pretend source, source code for the sort function in there somewhere would be if the first argument is less than the second argument, right? Everyone buy that? Hey, it doesn't work very well for this because what is an, a single element in the vector is a what? An employee, not, not an employee, but an employee, an employee, the address to an employee, right? There, it's employee pointer, and we're using new to allocate those. So what this is going to sort is you're going to sort all these, but they're going to be sorted by their order of appearance in memory, which isn't quite what you want. You want to sort it by grade. So you see that the sort function by itself is insufficient to sort, but... The, the creators of the standard uh, library had thought of that. And if you look, they have two versions of this function. So there's a version of sort that takes the first element in the list and the last, and that's where we got the begin and end. And then there's this version. It takes, you do the begin, you do the end, and you can actually provide a function that does comparing. So you actually need to write that function. And what it says is um, in comp, the elements are compared using less than. So exactly the way I wrote it here. So here's a bit of a poser for you. We'll go ahead and, and kind of answer this in class. Um, call it what you want. Let's call this uh, employee compare function. And let's see if this says what the signature of compare looks like. A binary function that a binary function just means that I don't know what that's I think it's referring to the arguments. Uh, that except I'm just confused why they're saying it's a binary function since they say that right here. Um, it accepts, accepts two elements basically from that container. So what kind of thing? So I have to put something here and I have to put something here. Each of these has to be an element that I would find in this vector. What kind of thing is in the vector? Employee pointer. So this is an employee pointer one and this is an employee 
pointer two. And this has to return a Boolean as to whether or not uh, it's going to return true or false. So you're going to do a comparison in here. You're going to do a less than comparison. What am I going to compare? The rank, the grade, right? So how do I get one's grade, right? How do I access the grade of one? Yeah, so this is, this is an, in, so what we want is one's grade, and we want two's grade. Now this is an incomplete answer. Say that again. Yeah, so there are two strategies for this. And one of them is to write another function where you could say get grade, right? And it's just a little one-liner that returns the grade. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me step away from this a moment and get back to our end game. So then how I use that function once it's written is I just name the function in here. I do not put the parentheses. You just write it just like that. And what this, not to um, hurt your head too much, but what happens when you write the name of a function without the parentheses, it turns out that is a function pointer. That is an address showing where the beginning of the function is. Uh, so what happens is this version of sort sees the third argument, and then it starts pulling off workers in these, this vector here and um, runs this function on them over and over and over again. So it's, a, it's really kind of a slick thing. But let's get back here to this. So yes, based on everything we know now, we, we would want to write a get grade function. And the reason is, why do we not want to do this here? Or why will this not work here? Because grade is private data, right? This, is a normal, this isn't a function of employee, this is a normal C style function, which means that this function is not allowed to peek at the private data of employee. And so this will not even compile. It'll say, I'm sorry, grade is private, you can't do that. So that's a, a good reason for using get grade. If you want to do that in this project, you're fine. But let me give you the, you are a C++ programming ninja version of this, okay? I, the, the C++ groan, wow, I think I invented a word, I like that, um, grade. <clears throat> did, did you realize that half of the, the clever words I gave you, I just made up? <laughs> all right, um, so you all are going to use this vocabulary that only I know, going out in the world. Um, here, here's the, the argument against using the get grade function. You know, that function is used, I got this big huge application, that function is used in one place and one place only, that's in this compare function. Uh, it's hard for me to justify creating that function, that function for, excuse me, yeah, it's har hard for me to justify creating the get grade function given that the only place I need it is in this compare function. Furthermore, this compare function is, in, it's not a member function, but it's so intimately bound to the employee class. This function has no meaning whatsoever where they're not an employee, right? The sole purpose for the existence of this function is to serve some need of the employee class. Once you accept that, now I can introduce you to another C++ construct. So I have my class employee. I've got private data, etc. I've got the public member functions. I've got a, a constructor. I've got um, a display. Thank you. All right. Now I can put a special notation in here called a friend function. And all I do, it doesn't matter where you put it, you can put it in here anywhere you want. It, 
whether it's in public or private, makes no difference. In fact, public and private have no meaning with what I'm about to do. You put the word friend, and then you put the prototype of a function here. In this case, the prototype for my function is right here. I can actually copy and paste it. Uh, I'm going to leave it on a different line since I, I don't have a lot of real estate on my screen here. Normally, I'd keep it on the same line. So lines 9 and 10 are the same line. Again, C++ doesn't care about spacing, blah, blah, blah. All right. What I am saying is that this function is a friend of the employee class. And therefore, as a friend of the employee class, this function has access to the private data. <coughs> okay. Now you know where the ninjas get their black clothes, right? It's from cool stuff like this. I don't know what that means, but I had to say it. It just came into my head. I'm not sure. There is a ninja clothing store, but no one can find it unless you're a ninja, so it's a weird chicken and egg thing. All right, so enough about my fashion tips here. Um, I have a, little, a lot I've just thrown at you. Let me let you sit for a second and think about this and see if you have a question you can fire at me. Like, what did you just say or something like that? Yes? We declared that friend function in Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So where do you actually house the function? I think that you're correct that since it is so intimately associated with employee, I would actually put a prototype in the header file. So I would take this and outside of the class declaration, I would put its prototype in the header file. In the source file I, of employee, I would go ahead and put this code. Yes? Friend, friend means that this function is allowed to access the private data of the employee class because I, I declared it a friend inside of the employee class. In fact, I'm going to break this line in a slightly different location to emphasize that friend is referring to that function. Yes? Can you, can you declare multiple friend functions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can go ahead and, and put as many as you want. Um, so... Yes, yeah, absolutely. It, it's tied to the prototype that immediately follows the word. Okay. Yes. Wait, did you say you put that function, you define it in the employee.pt file? I would. Mm -hmm. Why does it need to be a friend? Doesn't it already have access to the friend? No, no, no. no. You, can, you can write functions in employee.cpp all day long. None of those functions have access to the private um, data of employee. It's only, it's only, quote, coincidence that the functions you're writing in employee.cpp have access to the private data. That's because they're member functions. So, so to kind of restate it, what kinds of functions have access to employees' private data? Friend functions, fu that is, functions that are friends of the employee class, and member functions, that is, functions where you say that this function is only understood in the scope of employee. Right, the display function has access to employees' private data because this is a function of the employee. Now, the, the, so to get back to your original question, the fact that you're putting all these functions in employee.cpp is by convention. There's nothing, you could put the employee functions in depot.cpp and put the depot functions in equipment.cpp and so on and so forth, right? It's only by convention and for programmer sanity that we group all the employee functions in a file that we decided to name employee.cpp. So uh, in this specific example, the argument that I'm giving is twofold. One is that in my entire application, I'm only needing that get function in one place, meaning it's not getting widespread usage. Uh, in that, you know, there are exceptions to this. Uh, and that's combined with the only place it's being used is inside a function that by its very semantic meaning is uh, intimately tied to employee. Lines 25 through 31 mean nothing if I don't have an employee class.
right? This, this function is completely useless if I don't have an employee class. If I do have an employee class, it's very intimately bound. It's as in, I would argue that it's as intimately bound as a member function, meaning uh, what does employee's display function mean if there's no employee, right? It, it, it's intimately interacting with the private data. Uh, just as this, it, uh, you could say, has to interact intimately with the private data. However, given the nature of it, I'm not allowed to make it a member function. So I make it a normal function, I say it's a friend, and then that kind of promotes it to give it the same privilege as a member function. Now, uh, so that, take all that, I don't want to say with a grain of, th of salt, but say, take it as there's, it's really hard to have a, a uh, an easy to, it's, it's a design decision, I guess, is where I want, what I want to say, right? It's when you're sitting around the table with people and you're busting this stuff out and you're looking at the entire design of the application to decide whether it's appropriate to have accessor functions or whether it's appropriate for this particular function to be a friend. So I gave you some symptoms of what would merit being a friend function, but um, uh, there could be a programming house that's advocating just using accessor functions, and uh, I would not be one to argue with their decision. Other questions? Okay. So again, this will all be online to benefit you. And the secret word is? Uh, let me see. I'm not sure I remember what it was. Whoops. I already did that one, didn't I? All right. Um, there it is. Draw. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, okay. Dragon's Lair. So this is a fascinating game. So you all seen the arcade games that are the little cheesy pixels and stuff. This game is kind of a cartoon game in that there's a laser disc in there and there are all these cutscenes. And it's uh, and it's done by a former Disney animator and it's got a joystick and so the 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 knight walks up to a, a lava pit and he has to to jump onto chains you know at just the right order of fall in the lava and so you have to move this joystick at just the right time and if you do the video shows the progression and if you don't you get it, it's it's interesting because they're all cutscenes and the technology wasn't fast enough to make it seamless so you would get these delays of like I don't know a quarter of a second it would go black and then it would put the next scene up and uh, so it was a trippy game. Uh, but you'll note that it, it was unique enough to the genre that it did make its way to the Smithsonian. Uh, it also, you can find it all over for free online if you want to try it out on your computer. It's kind of an interesting little game to, to look at. Take a look.